Thank you, everyone. My name is Vicente Diaz. I'm from Barcelona, Spain, and I'm part of the Virus Auto team. And today we are going to discuss how AI is changing the malware landscape. So before we start, I apologize for talking about AI because I feel like this is the hype and everybody is talking about this. But at least my purpose for today is to explain things that I hope will be useful for everyone. So, okay, disclaimer. What I want to do today is explain what was our experience in VirusOtal for the last year using different LLMs for malware analysis. And I try to keep all the speech as down to earth as possible. I will try to make um, as less speculation as possible. And just to show you the things that we learn, what are the strengths and weaknesses uh, when it comes to LLMs in terms of malware analysis. And this is the whole purpose of this presentation, is to share with everyone what we have seen. And this is based on a subset of samples that we analyzed during this time. Um, but of course, this can change very quickly as the engines are evolving and as everything is changing very quickly. And of course, we will try to tackle some of the difficult questions like, Okay, did you find any APT using AI anyhow and this kind of stuff? Uh, I will show you what we did in order to try to answer these questions. Because honestly speaking, for the last year, this is what everybody was asking us. Like, hey, did you find any malware AI generated? Did you find any APT? Did you? So, well, I guess we all have the same questions, right, in our minds. So before we start, is there anyone here who is not familiar with VirusOtl? Never heard of VirusOtl? So I assume everybody knows what VirusOtl is, right? <laughs> in that case, we're going to skip this slide. It's just in case you never heard of VirusOtl, why this is a good place to make this study. Just yes, because we have a huge database, around 50 billion samples, and everything that has been submitted for the last year, we've been selecting some of these samples to be analyzed by, in this case, different LLMs. There are a couple of slides I have in my presentation I, I wish I, I never included, <laughs> and this is one of them. I don't think I need to explain to anyone why we are here today talking about AI. Everybody has seen what happened for the last year and a half, two years, uh, where are we now? So there is no need to explain where we are coming from, how LLMs work, et cetera, et cetera. However, even when theoretically all of us understand what is an LLM and how it works, I think still there are many open questions, right? And there are things that are difficult even for us to explain. So this is the whole goal of the presentation, trying to explain the things or trying to share with you the things that we saw, even if in some of them we don't have a very good explanation why they are behaving like this. So one year ago, actually, in VirusOtal, we implemented something that we call Code Insight. Code Insight basically was the use of one LLM for malware analysis. Now, what we were doing is LLMs are amazing creating code. How good are they in reading code and explaining what this code is doing? So that was the whole hypothesis. And we started throwing some easy to read code from suspicious samples into LLMs. For instance, macros from malicious office documents, PowerShell, uh, Visual Basic scripts, whatever. Anything that could be easily read by an analyst, we were throwing and we were getting the results. Probably in one year, we will be here discussing something a little bit more advanced. What we started to do this year is the same, but the compiling first binary code. So we get, in this case, a binary with a compile, and we ask the same question to the LLM. What is this code doing? The difference now is that we have huge windows of tokens, way bigger than we can use to create much more context around whatever we are asking to the LLM. So with this difference is why we are now able to do this the compiling. But let's get back to what happened one year ago. And once again, 
we were trying to understand how LLMs were useful in order to understand how malware was behaving. So what we implemented looks something like this. In Various Total, basically, you have aggregated data from a huge pipeline of security products. You will get the results for anything that you upload from around 70 different antiviruses. You will get results from dozens of different uh, security solutions, from different tools, from sandboxes, etc. We are not making a decision for you. It's not like, hey, this is malicious or not. We are just showing you the result of all this analysis. Now, you can see that there is a new thing here now, this code inside. So this is an example. In this case, uh, we can see this is some JavaScript. Uh, well, in reality, no, it's PS1, but for some reason, it's tag as JavaScript. And here it's saying, well, this is a PowerShell script that installs Postman client. It does by creating a new directory, downloading the client from the internet, extracting the installer, and then moving the executable to the new directory. The code is not malicious. It is a legitimate script. Now, if we compare this, if you read this, you have a very clear idea of what happened. So advantage number one, you don't need to analyze by yourself if you trust, in this case, LLM, and you save a lot of time. Because sometimes it's very, it's very easy to read a script, sometimes it's not. Advantage number two is that you get a non-binary uh, answer. When you are asking something like an antivirus, it's like, yes, this is malicious, or no, it's not malicious. And what else you get? You can get a verdict. And the verdict usually is not very verbose. It's not giving you a lot of information. Sometimes it's like giving you the family name, and this is enough, but sometimes it's not. What happens in the gray cases that are in the middle? Not clearly malicious, not sure if it is not malicious. Something like this is an installer. An installer is not very different from a dropper from the functionality perspective. Basically, it's getting something from the internet, installing in your computer. Is this one malicious or not? In order to know that, you need more context around. But you can see that in this case, nine antivirus engines, they decided this is malicious. Now, if you only have this antivirus input, you will consider, okay, this is malicious, that's it. But here, you get a full explanation. You can trust or not, you can decide. It's up to you. But for the first time, we have something that is comprehensive. We have something that is not uh, good or bad, and a verdict. We have a full explanation, and this changes a lot of things. You can use it however you want, but this is the first big thing, in this case, from LLMs. They are providing you with an explanation. And obviously, if you need to analyze something, it's saving you some time. Um, I think this is not very easy to read, so I will do it for you. The first thing is that you see, this is considered not malicious by the antiviruses. Now, we have here, in this case, two different LLMs. This one is saying, hey, this looks malicious. The second one, I will read for you. It says, the code is not malicious. It is a legitimate command that can be used to download and install software. However, the code could be used to download and install malicious software. For example, the file could be a virus or a Trojan horse. In this second example, things are not so clear. First, we see that two different LLMs are giving you slightly different answers. And we can see that the verdict itself is not being very clear. So once again, LLMs can be fine-tuned. They have temperature. They have different conditions that we can adjust. It depends how we are doing the prompting. So this is something that we need to learn how to do uh, the way that we want to get this answer. But what is important for me is that from these answers, basically, you can decide based on what is your criteria. So in your organization, if you find something like this, what you want to do. And this is something that we are not letting for a third party to do. We can decide by ourselves. So you can start seeing where I'm trying to get to in order that why this is something new and interesting. Is saving you a lot of uh, hours of analysis? Yes. But also, the way that it's presenting the information 
is something new. And this changes a lot of things. Okay, let's continue exploring things. So once that we got some understanding about this, like, okay, LLMs are interesting, how they are presenting results, how they are giving you this information, like, point taken, uh, let's see now what are the different things that they can do that maybe antiviruses are not doing or some other tooling that we have is not doing at the moment. So what's new with that? What we can do? And the first thing, it was checking how good they are at detecting exploits. The reason we were asking this basically was, it's not like something we were asking ourselves before. We simply saw that they were great, and we were like, why is that? So let me show you some numbers. Um, so here you can see we were checking for different exploits. Let me tell you what is this. All of those, the 100% the of the set, these are samples that the LLMs decided that they were exploiting something. And we were checking from all these samples how many of them are detected by the antiviruses. Usually we run all the samples uh, through a set of 70 antiviruses. So for 69% of all the samples, they were detected between zero and five antiviruses. Not only that, 41% of them, like this, they didn't have any detection, zero. And then five to 20, 18%, 20 plus, 13%. So we were like, wow, they are really good. Keep in mind, what we are analyzing here, these are scripts, okay? We are not analyzing binaries. But they were great at detecting that. So why? Why is this? And we have like some interesting answers. The first one is that in a lot of cases, the information about the exploit is inside of the script. Like when an LLM is checking some code, it's checking the code itself, but it's checking the variable names, it's checking the comments, it's checking the functions, it's checking any external reference, et cetera, et cetera. So if in your code you are like, hey, this code is for exploiting this CVE, whatever, this is what the LLM will take. And then you can think, well, this is absolutely absurd, right? We can put an information there and the LLM will have no idea what is happening. Before we go there, let me tell you a couple of more things. There is a big uh, set of samples that are very low hanging fruit because people is just taking the proof of concept from GitHub and simply recreating some exploit based on that. So you should think every antivirus in the world should be able to catch this as malicious. The answer is that many of them, they don't. Why is that? And the answer is because they don't really have a clear incentive to do so. Think about these kind of scripts. What they are doing, they are scanning the internet, they are checking for some remote vulnerability, and they are trying to exploit it. Now, if I'm an antivirus, if I'm an endpoint, maybe I'm just interested in protecting my endpoint. And whatever you are doing with your scripts, I don't care. Meaning that there is not an incentive for the antivirus for detecting this. However, the LLM doesn't care. It's just telling you what this is doing. And if this is exploiting something, well, maybe you want to know. What do you find some of these scripts inside of your org? And this is doing some internal mapping lateral movement, whatever, right? So this low-hanging fruit, okay, uh, it, it looks like a bit uh, fluffy that it's taking the information from these different variable names and comments and whatever, but at the same time, there is a point that this is actually giving us information for something that traditional tooling is not. And actually, um, we were uh, verifying all of them by hand, just to make sure that they were truly malicious. And it's still a lot of antiviruses, they were not catching this. In some cases, when this information was not available, maybe it was not able to detect the CVE itself, but the description of what it was exploiting was pretty accurate. So there is a point here where we don't fully understand how LLMs work, 
but we, what we saw is that there is a promising uh, potential even in improving this exploit detection. Okay, more questions that we were asking ourselves. Second one is like how they compare with antiviruses. And here I want to say that this is not the goal, like trying to, to I don't know, to, to, to showcase like this is doing better than this. We were just trying to understand what are the strengths and weaknesses and why, because we're trying how these things work. And many times we are not really sure. So in this case, what we were doing is comparing malicious scripts from different languages between AIs and between AVs. We started by Microsoft Office files. So Microsoft Office files, um, the antiviruses and the AIs were agreeing in 98.5% of the samples, meaning that they are very, very close. And we believe that the differences may be, I don't know, in the temperature, in whatever, but this is a very well-known format. So if you find some macros, there is like an army of different security tools that we will be able to detect this. This is very well known. It's like one of the first stages. So um, here, no problem. In the case of PowerShell files, um, attackers can be a little bit more creative. They can do different stuff, but in reality also it's a very well known format. And 96.23% of agreement between AVs and AIs. However, in PHP files, it is only a 72.4%. And we believe that this is for several reasons. The first one is that, as we said, incentives, right? If you're an endpoint and you're protecting your endpoint, maybe you don't care this PHP file is doing something externally, if this is vulnerable, this kind of stuff. Also, not every AI has the incentive to have a PHP engine to run the file and to understand what happens. And finally, uh, most of the time, this is done through um, checking for different patterns in the code. And in case that they are found is when this is triggering the detection from the AV. So the point here is that if there is any kind of obfuscation, this is making life very hard for antiviruses unless they have any kind of engine. And here comes the, I will say, one of the, the mysterious capabilities from LLMs, which is the obfuscation, and we will see in a minute. Uh, before that, I want to show you this example. So in this example, uh, this is a script executing some, invoking some PowerShell, and you can see here is like uh, downloading this, uh, upload dcx.x, and then uh, this is basically changing the path and execu executing the file and everything. If you are wondering, I check myself, and this file is malicious. But it doesn't really matter. If you find this kind of behavior, we are again in the problem of, is this a dropper or is this an installer, right? Um, but for some reason, this has zero AV detections. And, and once again, it's because AV is they find a lot of nuances. In like, is this executing correctly? Is, that, uh, is there any problem here? And sometimes, when you find something internally in your network, that is like defunct for some reason, or it's just waiting to put some parameter from the attacker in order to execute. Um, this kind of stuff, antiviruses, are not really good at finding. But in this case, we can see that uh, AIs, they don't have any trouble. Now, about obfuscation. This is another example. And here, um, at some point, I was thinking, okay, let's check all the different types of obfuscation. It's very hard, so I didn't do it, I'm sorry. But we were trying to find the most interesting ones or the most popular ones. Just again, for the sake of comparing. So here, even if you can read, I will tell you, well, I will not tell you everything here, but you can see that this is base 64, probably. This is a very well-known format used everywhere for email, for attachments, whatever. And this is very easily to decrypt. You can do it automatically. Everybody's doing that, so no problem. Here I have the green box because AV detection is good. AVs, they understand this. This is malicious, no problem. In the second case is where we start uh, creating uh, strange variable names, replacing, making loops, et cetera, et cetera, until we get the final code. And in this case, well, this is harder. AV detection, it falls dramatically, but LLMs, 
they are good at, dedicate, at, at the obfuscating this. How they do that? Somehow in runtime, they are able to, to find a way to deobfuscate this. And this is one of the big advantages. In terms of saving time for analysis, et cetera, this is absolutely great because we don't need to spend any time. We can simply check the result and see what is the description. And actually, there are different uh, tools in order to detect if something is obfuscated. In a case of a binary, you are checking things like entropy in different sections, et cetera, which is easier to find there is something weird. In case of text files, it's not so easy. Uh, but again, LLMs were detecting, like, uh, let's put it the other way. Traditional tools were only detecting 5% of the cases that LLMs were saying, hey, this is obfuscated. So there is a lot, um, th th there's a lot of potential. Like we were discovering every time one more thing that LLMs are doing and we didn't expect. And this is one more. File type identif identification. So if you're an operating system and you get one file, how do you know what is that? Basically, you check something called the magic bytes, which are the first bytes of the file. And these bytes are saying, hey, I'm a P, like portable executable. OK. So me, the operating system, I understand the format. I know where I need to go to find the data, to find the imports, to put it in memory, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I'm a text file, things are harder. Because the operating system is like, OK, you're a text file, but what kind of text file? And text files can be anything, right? So when you are checking a text file, basically you are checking the extension, file extension, et cetera. But in some cases, um, it's very hard to understand what is a text file without this context. Because there are like so many programs, it could be absolutely anything, right? And this was a, a, a funny example. We were checking, um, you know, the, the movie Barbie and Oppenheimer, right? So we were checking if there is any mal malware related to Barbie and Oppenheimer, and we found this file. And we were like, how is this related to, to Oppenheimer, right? So I don't know if you can read this, probably not. But if anyone in the room can tell me what kind of file type is this based on this information. Well, I've only found one person in one conference who was able to tell me. I was pretty surprised. Uh, but I believe that it's very hard for you to see. So it's maybe not even <laughs> feasible, right? But OK, we'll give it a try. If anyone can give me what kind of file type is this, um, I, I, I don't know if I have any prices, but uh, we will be all clapping <laughs> for for this person. Any, any tries? No, it's not a binary. It's a text file. Uh, well, it's, it's configuration, not for graphic. Uh, MATLAB is not exactly MATLAB, but uh, you are getting closer. Is it SCADA? SCADA, no. Uh, but you, you are all getting closer in the right direction. Postscript? No, not Postscript. OK, as, as I don't have anything to give away, I'm sorry, I, I will just stop here before you, <laughs> you actually find out, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, I will read for you. This code is a LAMPS input script for simulating a system of water molecules. It used the Leonard Jones potential for the interactions between atoms and the bone Oppenheimer, ah, Oppenheimer approximation for the interactions between molecules. The simulation is run for 80,000 steps. So I don't, I don't understand what I read, um, <laughs> but it sounds very impressive, right? Like from the previous file to deduce something like this, it means that there is a, a very uh, impressive potential in detecting all these kind of files. And this is something that can make a difference. Imagine that you are doing an investigation. You have no idea what is this kind of file. And then it's giving you like the exact like, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, file that it is, right? So this was very surprising. Has a lot of potential, but still we, we are just discovering this kind of stuff. OK, now let's go into what kind of attacker's activity we saw in terms of AI. So let's start with the easier stuff. 
uh, I think I am, I'm eating my time, but anyways. Uh, is all these from injection attempts. So this is something we were expecting, of course, when we were having uh, code injection, uh, code inside for the first time, we were expecting everybody to use something like this. Um, happily, this is easy to detect, easy to control, but you can see like, uh, and there are like many frameworks now, including one from Google, different attacks and different kind of threats in different stages for AIs, et cetera, et cetera. Like you can see like uh, in this case, ignore everything, right? Um, but these things, well, are easy to control. But of course we saw that. The next thing we saw is, remember we were talking about CVEs and we said, yeah, the CVE can be a comment in the code. So the LLM is reading that, blah, blah, blah. This one I love. So if you see this, uh, it's detected by 23 uh, different uh, antiviruses, and then code inside is saying the same. Um, the code connects to remote host, then it reads from the stream and executes it. So this sounds very scary, right? It's connecting and executing something. The data is likely to be malicious and designed to launch more attacks. Okay, doesn't look good. The code also has the ability to create puppies. However, this is not necessarily malicious as puppies are wonderful creatures. So we all agree that puppies are wonderful creatures, but why is saying that? It's simply because in this case, the variables, names, and everything were replaced by puppies. So imagine that you have this kind of factory class, whatever, and you're creating something, and you're creating puppies, and the LLM goes like, well, okay. It looks malicious, but you know, puppies, come on. They are wonderful. <laughs> so, so this was, uh, a brilliant one, to be honest. Now it's under control, but keep trying, I, I love it. Now, uh, we were also checking about different malware who is trying to use AI for distribution. And we see this all the time. You know, all these malware campaigns that are trying to tell you about paying taxes or telling you about Kardashian, I don't know. Uh, in this case, uh, this is malware impersonating AI-related software and services. So it could be anything. It could be they have the name, um, like, I don't know, local client for chat GPT, or they are using the same icon, or they are using whatever. So we can see this peak of, of samples, but nothing that impressive. It was more interesting checking interaction with OpenAI, where we saw some peaks. But to be honest, we couldn't find any good explanation why they are doing that. So this is a bit disappointing, but I would say let's keep keeping an eye on this and see how this evolves. Finally, the big question, right? How to find this AI-generated malware? Um, here I have a lot to say. <laughs> the first thing is that I talk to many people and it's not a clear answer how you can distinguish that something was AI generated versus something that was not. So what is clear is if you are coding, any of you, you will take advantage of anything that makes your code to be faster, more reliable, et cetera, right? Um, if you are using an AI for this, this is normal. It doesn't mean that the code will look that different at the end. Maybe one day we will find some sample that we will be we will all agree in this room, we have never seen a sample like this in our lives. Uh, and this is kind of magical when you see the code. But it's really hard to, where to start to check for something like this. So this is my very personal opinion. Everybody will benefit from having this kind of tools. We'll make code easier, more agile. Uh, and then from here, you can make the, you can make the, the main lines that you want. You can say like it's making, exploiting for zero days automatic and things like that. Well, it's simply like a tool that you can use to make things easier. And it's normal that everybody will be using that. Having said that, I will tell you things that we found. And we found some funny stuff. For instance, uh, we were looking for different samples where we can see anything giving us some clues of using open AI or using any other LLM for generating anything, right? 
we found something, uh, some cobalt strike samples. We found some metaprater uh, beacon. But uh, when analyzing the samples, we couldn't find any real difference with, uh, let's say, usual ones. So we guess it's some kind of experiments. Everybody is experimenting and uploading stuff. We believe also this is an experiment, but this is a funny one. Because here you, can ha you have the prompt that was used to generate this script. So let me go through the prompt very quickly. Write a PowerShell script that disables user input, changes the background to NyanCat, disables all network internet access, encrypts files, blah, 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 then changes the user password to a random string, then disables all fans in the system, overclocks the CPU by 200%, overclocks the GPU by 200%, overboils the RAM by 150%, and then it stresses the hardware to maximum. So what kind of a script <laughs> will you get when you're prompting something like this? And here's the answer. Actually, it's pretty good, it's brilliant. The first one is that it's using the, the registry just to include a path to the desktop. Remember, you want Neon cut. So here you have Neon cut. It's not a path to a file, it's not a path to an image, it's just NeonCAD. So in the registry for the image that you have in your desktop, it's just NeonCAD. And this only works, obviously, for Windows, right? So then it's doing some stuff here and there. Uh, the next one is well, the wallpaper, in this case, uh, that we discussed. Again, Windows, registry, blah, blah, blah. And then when we reach this point, it's like uh, using two different configuration files uh, in this case, to overbolt the GPU uh, with the frequency. I don't know if this is even possible, but this is the path of a Linux file. So basically, you have one single script that needs, that is using two different operating systems to operate, just because the prompt was so crazy and complex, that the easier way that it found was to combine two different operating systems. Um, uh, well, <laughs> this is the best we found. This is what I can say. Uh, I found it hilarious. Uh, I'm sorry you don't find it so hilarious. But uh, it was <laughs> really funny because I couldn't understand what was this. Um, what we are, uh, and this is, the remember I told you I wish I didn't include some slides? This is the second I wish I didn't include. Because here I have this video um, in YouTube, which is uh, Trump and Biden singing Sultans of Swing, which, <laughs> It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, now I, I regret, I don't know why I didn't include it here. Anyways, it's absolutely brilliant. The voices are on spot and, and it really sounds good. But this was like uh, interesting for me a few months ago. Nowadays, you can create this video from text. You can create this video from one frame of a picture and everything. And th this is absolutely outdated. And I just did this slide, I don't know, three months ago. So what I mean here is that when we are talking about social engineering, there is a way to go. And probably this is where we will see the biggest uh, problems, right? I guess everybody heard of this case where there was this deep fake uh, during uh, an online meet, and there was this CEO fraud asking to someone in the company to, to wire some money. And this kind of very simple stuff that is somehow out of reach from technology to some extent, right? So we should assume having perfect voice impersonation, having perfect video, this will happen. And we will see how this improves social engineering attacks, especially for distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was a recent report uh, from Mandian and Trends, and in here they were discussing things like, well, we see that inside of the attack, uh, inside of the victims, the attackers are moving faster in terms of creating scripts, et cetera, et cetera. This is a little bit what we were discussing. And we are also talking to some folks inside of uh, uh, Google like, to create better metrics to understand how this uh, distribution of social engineering content is growing or not, and how the quality is improving or not. Like, are attackers now able to 
send different fraud in different languages is like more accurate or like creating different stuff for different people, we should be easy to do, right? Once that you can automate all of this, just check your Facebook profile, LinkedIn, whatever, and create something that looks easy. Okay, so let's go into some conclusions. Um, so the first one is, is AI lowering the bar for attackers? And here is what I was discussing one minute ago. Do you really think it's necessary? Like, are attackers having a really hard time getting into their victims? Um, is that a technical problem in some cases? So there are many considerations here, right? But if we are talking from the point of view of uh, you know, uh, getting the maximum return on investment, in many cases, probably this is not necessary. If you can use it like you are using, I don't know, uh, to create more agile stuff inside of the big team, et cetera, et cetera, probably for distribution, for social engineering, okay. But in reality, to create malware itself, I don't think we are here yet. And I don't think this is really necessary. And we're, we're talking about lowering the bar. The bar is pretty low, let's be clear. And it's just making all developers to, to use tools that they didn't have before. So it's natural that they will be going quicker and, and creating interesting stuff, right? Now, second question is AI changing malware. And I here think we have this wall that is how you can say for sure that this code was created by an AI or it was created by someone. How do I know if you are copying the code from your neighbor, from Stack Overflow, from some AI? It's very difficult to say, right? Unless we find something that we all agree because it's so sophisticated, et cetera. And here we have the second problem. If something is so sophisticated, are we able to catch this as of today with our technology? So it's a very hard question. And I'm not sure we should really um, be paying that much attention to this. When we look at the trends, and we were looking at the trends, we couldn't find anything that relevant. We couldn't find any malware family like, oh, suddenly this family is undetected. Suddenly these samples are so different from the previous ones, et cetera, et cetera. It was very hard for us even to, to think how to find this stuff. So, well, we will see, I guess. But once again, if they are doing so well that we are not able to detect, we are half blind to that. And finally, what are the implications for detection, hunting, and monitoring, right? And here I think that this is probably the most interesting takeaway from this, is that we are having new and more powerful tools that will help us to understand better, to go quicker in terms of analysis. But above all of this, what we are having is a different way of understanding what malware is doing. So it's not just a binary verdict, it's like an explanation. And here we can adjust all this tooling to our own criteria. And I think this makes a difference. At this point, I'm not sure how, uh, and this is a very personal opinion, but I think we are not sure how this can be a, a real difference in the long term. So just to finish, um, what I think we should do is are using more these AI engines for everything. Just because they are amazing, just because by using them we are discovering a lot of stuff that we never thought before, and this is what I was trying to share today. We learn all of this, but we're not looking for any of that. It's just something that by using it, we were able to understand. And this opens many different implications. Not only how LLMs work, but also what we can do with this information, how we can use this in a better way. At the same time, as I said, having this kind of second opinion is another signal we have amongst all the different technical staff, amongst all these verdicts. We have also these AIs um, explaining to us what this is doing. And this is a very powerful signal. I think it's perfect to complement the current technology, just to give, in, give in us like more information about what we're analyzing, and then once again, we are able to decide. And finally, I encourage everyone to share. Uh, this is 
like a ridiculous, like a small period of time since we started playing with this. This started a couple of years ago, like everybody to take a look into that. This is nothing. This is changing all the time. We are now, uh, we started doing these experiments, in this case with the scripting languages. Now we are decompiling and we are throwing these pseudo lens and we are also getting results. So very soon we will have a new set of results analyzing binaries. And this is just the beginning. I think the more we share, the more we all benefit from this collectively. And we can be wrong, it's absolutely fine, but let's keep playing with this, let's keep sharing so we get a better understanding. At the end of the day, we want all the same, which is being able to protect our community. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>